Hey yo, from the kingdom of Ohio, you are listening to the O-Culture Podcast. I'm your host, Ryan Peverly. Welcome to the D-Program. Thks for stopping by the old uh, self-grappling show. But no self-grappling here this time, at least on the surface. You can judge that for yourself. Regardless, Sandor Katz is in the house to talk to us a bit about the art and alchemy of fermentation. Uh, this is one of the steps in the ancient alchemical process, both the material uh, and the spiritual versions. It's also an easy and practical way to reclaim your food and your health, because fermented foods are easy to make yourself and can help revitalize your gut microbiome, which has become quite the hot topic in health and wellness circles in the last couple years. Surely we all know what probiotics, prebiotics, and postbiotics are by now. And we get into that as well, this war on bacteria that a lot of us are unknowing participants in. Hopefully after this chat, we're a bit more comfortable with the culture growing inside us and on us. Sandor is a New York Times best-selling author for what that's worth. His books include Wild Fermentation and The Art of Fermentation, both of which we drew on for the chat here. There is a short Patreon extension, only 15 minutes or so due to Sandor's schedule. And if you're on Patreon, you don't have to look for anything extra. The audio is automatically included in the version you're listening to. So sit back, relax, grab a pickle or a bottle of kombucha, and let this consciousness-enhancing audio ferment your fucking soul. That might have been a bit hyperbolic. Oh well, enjoy. Sandor Katz, welcome to the show, man. Really appreciate your time. Really looking forward to chatting with you. Thanks so much for having me, Ryan. I'm happy to be here talking to you. Definitely. It makes two of us for sure. So, you know, you have a fascinating story. Obviously, people who have followed your work know it, but there are people in our audience here who don't know it, and I'd love for you to share it if you don't mind. What was going on in your life when you discovered the science and art of fermentation? It's quite a personal journey here. Sure. So, I mean, first of all, I should just, you know, be clear that fermentation has always been part of my life. And I would say, you know, this is really true probably for anyone who is listening to this and, you know, for virtually every individual in virtually every part of the world. And what I mean by that is products of fermentation were part of what we were eating in my family. And some of the really common products of fermentation would be bread, cheese, cured meats, condiments soy sauce, fish sauce, vinegar, and in my case, pickles. You know, I was the, the grandchild of refugees from uh, Belarus and in Eastern Europe. And some of the, you know, foods of Eastern Europe, including pickles, were just part of what we ate. And as a kid, I loved, loved, loved pickles. It's not that I was thinking about fermentation or how you make them. It's not like anyone in my family was making them. We were, we were buying them. But this, you know, very pronounced flavor of fermentation, lactic acid on these sort of, you know, old world sour pickles that we ate really imprinted on me. And so I've always been drawn to flavors of fermentation. In my mid-20s, I spent a couple of years following a macrobiotic diet. And one aspect of that diet is an emphasis on the digestive benefit of pickles and other kinds of live fermented foods. And during this time, I started noticing that these pickles that I had been eating my entire life, whenever I would eat them, or even before I would eat them, when I would be looking at them and smelling them, I could feel the salivary glands under my tongue begin squirting out saliva. So I began to associate these foods with getting my digestive juices flowing in a, you know, really quite a literal sense. But I still wasn't making them myself. I was living in New York City. They were abundantly available in stores. But in 1993, which is 26 years ago now, I moved from my hometown of New York City to rural Tennessee. And I was you know, sort of drawn here by a community that I became part of, and I jumped right into gardening. And that first season that I was, that I was gardening, you know, I observed something which is, you know, in retrospect, kind of an obvious part of agriculture and food production, but because I was such a naive city kid, I'd never really thought about that. And that is just the, the simple reality that all your cabbage in the garden is ready at about the same time. All your radishes in the garden are ready at about the same time. So when I was looking at this abundance of cabbage that, that first year gardening, I decided I should learn about sauerkraut and how to make sauerkraut. I knew that I liked sauerkraut. I knew that sauerkraut 
was associated with preservation of cabbage, but I didn't know how to do it. And so I looked in this basic cookbook, the, the Joy of Cooking, and I learned how to make sauerkraut from the Joy of Cooking. And I couldn't believe how simple and straightforward it was. I couldn't believe how delicious it was. I couldn't believe how, how good it was making me feel. That led me down this rabbit hole of fermentation. Now, the other thing that was going on in my life that's a big part of the story of how I came to move from New York City to rural Tennessee, what made me sort of so ready to walk away from the career that I was pursuing in New York, and that is basically that in 1991, I tested HIV positive. You know, so suddenly I had this sort of other factor to consider in my, in my life decisions, and at that time, there were no effective treatments, and you know, I was very interested in um, alternative and holistic medicine and, and food as medicine. You know, learning about the digestive benefit of pickles, I started to realize that live culture fermented foods were also associated with improved immune function, you know, ways that science did not fully understand, but that, you know, eating bacteria rich foods, what we might call probiotic foods, you know, actually stimulate immune function. So, you know, I just got really interested in these foods, you know, as a way of improving digestion, as a way of improving immune function, and also recognizing that they, that they all tasted great and that, you know, fermented foods have these strong pronounced flavors that, for the most part, I was really drawn to. You know, really, I spent the next 10 years just really like trying to learn about as many different kinds of fermented foods as I, as I possibly could. And I, I got a bit of a reputation because I was always showing up with different fermentation experiments. One of my friends started calling me Sandor Kraut. Some other friends invited me to teach a sauerkraut making workshop at an event that they were organizing. Turned out that teaching about fermentation was fun and that you know a lot of people were terrified of the idea of cultivating bacteria in a jar because we have been taught to be so fearful of bacteria. And so the question that kept coming up is, how can I be sure that I have good bacteria growing in my jar of fermenting cabbage and, uh, you know, not some dangerous bacteria that might, uh, you know, make me sick or, or, or even potentially kill somebody? So, um, you know, people would project all of their anxiety that they'd been taught to have about bacteria in general onto the process of fermentation when, in fact, I mean, fermentation really is a strategy for food safety. And the statistics are impressive. I mean, in the realm of fermented vegetables, there is no case history recorded anywhere of illness or food poisoning from fermented vegetables. And if you contrast that with the statistics on fresh vegetables, I mean, we read every year about, you know, outbreaks of, you know, salmonella or E. coli illnesses from tomatoes, lettuce, spinach, you know, different vegetables. I mean, clearly there's the possibility of incidental contamination. But the reality is that if you were to ferment those foods that had been contaminated, the indigenous population dominated by lactic acid bacteria would easily dominate over incidental contaminants. And as they acidify the environment, they would destroy whatever cells of E. coli or salmonella or, uh, you know, other organisms associated with food poisoning. And you know, that's one of the things that's so elegant and magical about fermentation as a strategy for preservation and food safety is that the byproducts of the fermentation are what make the food so safe and really protect it from, you know, random environmental bacteria. Yeah, man. And I knew we were going to get into bacteria quite a bit here. And I'm glad we're there already because I, <laughs> I have a question about, about a word that we use to describe bacteria. In some way. And I just want to share something first, though. This is actually from the, uh, the Forward to Wild Fermentation. Uh, I believe it's your first book about the subject here. So this is from Sally Fallon Morell. She says that the science and art of fermentation is, in fact, the basis of human culture. Without culturing, there is no culture. Culture begins at the farm, not at the opera house, end quote. And that word culture is a fascinating term to me because, you know, most people would think of human culture in terms of language or music or art or books or belief systems and food too, I suppose. But culture is also a term that we use to describe bacteria, which is what fermentation is all about, as you were just talking about. What do you make of the ways we use this term culture, though? Well, I mean, I think, I think it's totally fascinating. And, you know, I would say that, you know, the, the cultural realm, like the word culture I mean, it's related to cultivation. It really derives from 
cultivation. And so, you know, the first thing we cultivate as human cultures is the soil. You know, we develop crops, we save seeds, and we sort of, you know, build societies and cultures around the practice of agriculture. And our sense of, you know, what we can cultivate has expanded over time. So it's not just cultivating the soil. We might be you know, cultivating certain values in our children. We might be cultivating skills. You know, we might be cultivating culinary techniques that might, you know, that are all of the things we love to eat and drink that are generally not the raw products of agriculture, but that we create from the raw products of agriculture. So certainly fermentation is an important part of the vast realm that we would consider to be culture. But, you know, another way to think about culture is, you know, we know about genetics and uh, we each are the product of genetics coming from our father and from our mother. And we're sort of this unique combination of genetics. And, you know, it's the manifestation of our genetic code that determines many of the physical qualities that we embody. So genetics are information that's passed on biologically. I would say that everything that's outside of genetics that we pass down is encompassed by culture. So language, the language that we speak to one another and that we teach to our children, that's an important part of culture. You know, our concepts about how we relate to the world around us and any kind of afterlife, you know, that's part of culture also how we sustain ourselves, how we dress ourselves, how we shelter ourselves, how we nourish ourselves. This is all part of of culture. So, you know, the foods that we eat are an important part of this and all of the techniques for how we cultivate the foods that we grow and how we prepare the products of agriculture and transform them into the foods and drinks that we enjoy. Like that is vital cultural information that, you know, until the last couple of generations was just typically passed down from generation to generation. But we've seen quite a bit of discontinuity, a severing of this sort of passing down of this cultural information generation after generation, you know, because of the mass production of food, I would say, more than anything else. So human cultures decided that they were going to liberate themselves from this necessity of spending time cultivating the soil, producing agricultural products, transforming those things into the food that we like to eat, because it's more convenient to um, allow mass production to create those things and then just go to the supermarket and buy them, often in forms that are already prepared for us. So we just have to heat them up or something like that. And I mean, convenience is, is all well and good. But I would say that increasingly, people are, I mean, people are really yearning for, you know, some tangible connection to the food that they're eating. And, and the fact that we're, you know, so many of us uh, are severed from the, the, the processes of, of growing food and preparing food, you know, has, has left many people just feeling a real sense of disconnection. And so I would say that there are, you know, more and more people who are, you know, trying to reclaim their connection to food. And Part of it is a biological connection to plants and animals and soil and land. And part of it is a cultural connection to the foods of their grandparents, the the foods that speak to a sense of tradition and, um, you know, where they're coming from culturally. So, um, you know, I'm just continually meeting people who are trying to, you know, reclaim some kind of a connection to food. And that's part of what makes them get interested in fermentation, because in every cultural tradition, fermentation is, you know, just part of the picture of how food is prepared. And, you know, while I certainly do not possess an encyclopedic knowledge of food traditions around the world, I have been looking for, you know, more than a quarter century now that I've been involved in fermentation, I've been looking for counterexamples for culinary traditions that do not incorporate any fermentation and really Every time anybody has suggested a possible one, I've been able to learn about some kind of fermented foods or beverages that are part of that that tradition. And, you know, one of the insights of microbiology, I mean, it's really important to recognize that fermentation has been practiced for thousands of years. Fermentation is part of nature. 
Fermentation really does not require human techniques, but there's good archaeological evidence that humans have been intentionally practicing fermentation for at least 10,000 years. But you don't have to know about bacteria and fungi to practice fermentation. And you know, really, it's only about 150 years ago that biologists began to accept that fermentation was a life process and that the, the agents of fermentation were bacteria and fungi. And what microbiology has illuminated for us is that everything we could possibly eat, all of the plants and all of the animal products that make up our food are populated by these elaborate communities of microorganisms. So there's a certain inevitability to microbial transformation of our food. And everywhere in the world, people observe that under certain conditions, food would become more delicious, more easily digestible more stable for short or long-term preservation rather than decomposing into a disgusting, ugly mess that nobody would ever want to put into their mouths. So there is a certain inevitability to microbial transformation of our food and the mind-boggling array of different kinds of fermented foods and beverages that people around the world enjoy is really sort of testament to this inevitability of microbial transformation of our food and how people have harnessed this uh, invisible natural force in order to elevate our food in different ways. Yeah, and I'm glad that you mentioned the uh, the reclaiming our food bit. I had actually written down that phrase in my notes here for the chat, and I was thinking about that the other day, and I was thinking that it's it is about growing your own food and like having a better relationship with what you put into your body, but it doesn't have to begin there. Like to me, it was taking that first step of actually being in a farmer's market or a grocery store where you are picking out your own food, you know, like especially now when you can have it delivered to you. That's so weird to me these days where I don't even have to see my groceries for them to be in my house. I started doing that, Sander. Like I just started going to the grocery multiple times a week to pick out my food so I didn't buy in bulk, you know, and, and, and just had fresh food on hand all the time. And I have found like tremendous health benefits from that. And granted, it's the type of food I'm choosing as well, right? But it's also like I feel better when I go and I pick it out myself. I pick up a green pepper and I actually hold it and feel it in my hands. And I think, yeah, this is the one for me right now. I put it in my bag. I come home, I slice it up, and I eat it. And I think, oh man, that relationship right there that I built with that piece of food is so different than me having it delivered to me or me driving through a drive through and getting a whatever, you know? It's just, oh, it's just, I don't know. It's, it's, yeah, it's yeah. beautiful I mean, in some I, way. I, I absolutely agree with you that like, you know, re reclaiming is where you find it. There, there's not just like one way to reclaim food. And, you know, any small step that sort of makes you feel a little bit closer to the source of your food is a good one. And whether that's just going to the market more frequently and, you know, enjoying fresher food, whether that's, you know, going to a farmer's market or visiting a farm and at least getting to know someone who's producing the food, getting to see where the food is actually grown, or whether it's having a little community garden plot or growing some herbs in your window or a tomato plant in a pot or something on your roof or in your yard or cultivating bacteria in a jar in your kitchen. I mean, you know, all of these are possible ways of just feeling more connected to your food. And, you know, I don't think that there's just one way to do this. And I think depending on, you know, your situation and where you are, you know, it, it can manifest in all, all kinds of, of different ways, but it's just like turning a little bit of your attention to it and, and recognizing that, you know, food is an important part of our lives, not only as sustenance for our organism, but food is the embodiment of all these, uh, you know, biological relationships and cultural relationships. And, you know, the more, the more we invest in it, the more we can get from it. And also, you know, the more we can share it with other people. Definitely, man. And I want to clarify something that you wrote in The Art of Fermentation. You had mentioned that fermentation goes back 10,000 years, maybe even longer. Who really knows, right? But you wrote in this book that it's important to recognize that fermentation is a natural phenomenon much broader than human culinary practices. Cells in our bodies are capable of fermentation. In other words, humans did not invent or create fermentation. It would be more accurate to state that fermentation created us. So could you elaborate on that? How did fermentation create us? 
So, you know, if you, if you ask a biologist, what is fermentation, they're going to have a slightly different answer. And rather than saying, you know, foods and beverages transformed by the action of microorganisms, you know, what they're going to say is fermentation is the production of energy without oxygen, anaerobic metabolism. So yes, the cells of our bodies are capable of fermentation. Generally, we function in this uh, respiratory mode, which is aerobic. So we have this elaborate system that carries oxygen to every cell in our bodies, and our cells can produce energy most efficiently using oxygen. But sometimes we make demands of you know, muscles or groups of muscles and demand that they produce energy beyond the amount of oxygen that they have to work with. And so they can revert to this alternative mode of energy production, fermentation, where they produce energy without oxygen. And what's less efficient about it in our bodies is it produces this byproduct, lactic acid, and generally will experience that as a as a sort of burning sensation in the muscles that we are exerting. But the the larger point is that, you know, cellular fermentation precedes a human evolution. And generally, these days, evolutionary biologists would agree that all life on Earth is descended from bacteria and other single-cell organisms. And it's also generally understood that in the earliest evolutionary times, the atmosphere of the Earth did not contain oxygen, that it developed oxygen as a result of microbial processes that produced oxygen. And so basically, the earliest life forms were anaerobic, which means they were fermenting. So, you know, if all life and all multicellular organisms, including ourselves, are evolved from anaerobic bacteria, to me, what that says is that, you know, fermentation generated all of the life on on earth. And then the other thing is that if all life is descended from bacteria, our present reality, which we're just beginning to recognize, is that our bodies are host to an incredible number and incredible diversity of microorganisms. And it turns out that that is the case for every multicellular form of life. So we're all descended from bacteria, and none of us have ever lived without bacteria. So, you know, we are entirely dependent on bacteria for effective digestion, for our immune function. Turns out bacteria play a role in, you know, regulating our brain chemistry and many other systems in our bodies. And, uh, you know, the same is true for a a carrot. A carrot has symbiotic bacteria that live with it and help it to access uh, nutrients from the soil. And, you know, basically all multicellular organisms, you know, live with symbiotic bacteria that give them some of their functionality. So I think it's simply a reality that, that we're acknowledging more and more that bacteria are our ancestors and that we couldn't possibly exist without them. And so, you know, this war on bacteria, thinking that bacteria are our enemies and they need to be destroyed by any means necessary is really an antiquated way of thinking. You know, we have to coexist with bacteria. You know, we have to find ways of working with bacteria. Yeah, and there's um and there's so many different things you said there that I want to talk about or at least touch on, but before we get into some different areas of conversation, I wanted to go back to a couple terms that you use in the book that I think plays into what we were just talking about. You use this term coevolution a lot in your books. You also use this term biophilic consciousness. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about those terms and what they mean and how you use them. Sure. So, I mean, coevolution is simply the recognition that, you know, okay, usually or often evolution is depicted in this sort of linear manner. We'll see depictions of humanity's evolution or some other kind of organism's evolution. But the reality is that evolution is never a, a singular process. We evolved along with these microorganisms that are part of us. And in the time frame, you know, that we have been evolving, they have been evolving as well. And we have been evolving sort of, you know, in relation to one another. And then when you start thinking about like the, the, the crops that, that we eat, like most of the crops that we eat, whether we're talking about, you know, plant crops or whether we're talking about domesticated a- animals, but 
you know, none of them sort of evolved in nature exactly into the form in which we currently eat them. You know, they have evolved through cultivation. And then through our heavy dependence on a relatively limited number of animals and uh, plants that we eat, they have also shaped our evolution. So, you know, this is what I mean by, by coevolution is that, you know, all the different forms of life that are interacting with one another, they're all evolving, you know, sort of through long biological time but they're not evolving in isolation. They're evolving always in relationship to one another. And that's what I call co-evolution. Now, this other term that you ask about, this idea of biophilic consciousness, you know, this is actually a a term that I got from an important biologist and essayist, E.O. Wilson. But I mean, it's really just the idea of trying to cultivate in ourselves and in our culture and in our children through education, you know, an an awareness of ourselves as biological beings in a complex matrix of other biological beings. And so, you know, not imagining ourselves in isolation or as the as the king of the heap or or anything like that, but 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 rather to, you know, think of ourselves in relation to the trees and to the fungi and to the birds and to the small mammals and to the fish in the ocean and just realizing that our human existence is not in isolation you know we we exist in relationship to this you know much broader uh, matrix of of life and you know i think that modern human culture for the most part has encouraged us to really think of ourselves as being outside of nature and I think that, you know, that's a terrible, you know, mistake. And we really need to be thinking of ourselves and our futures in relationship to all these other forms of life. And that we, we are part of this matrix of life, not apart from it. Yeah, absolutely, man. And you mentioned uh, the war on bacteria. I've seen and heard that term other places as well. And every time I, I come across it, I think, well, you know, I'm made of bacteria inside of me, on me. So I kind of view it as it's that's a war on humanity on, on some level. Maybe that's a bit hyperbolic, but it kind of is, though. I mean, if you think about it, like, we're obsessed with hygiene. I don't know why. I mean, I get it. Maybe it's, it's you know, corporate marketing that makes you obsessed with these trends or whatever. But we just seem to be terrified of, of germs and bacteria. And I'm wondering, from your perspective, obviously, when you wrote these books, you know, many years ago, we were kind of in this phase where I don't know if, if it was just me, but... It seems like there is a lot more discussion these days publicly about this kind of topic. Have you seen any progress in this war on bacteria to come to terms with the fact that, you know, maybe this stuff is actually really good for us as a population? Well, yeah, sure. I mean, I think, I mean, certainly biology has become much more nuanced and sort of the you know, the 20th century party line that bacteria are mostly dangerous and need to be destroyed. I mean, science certainly has a much more nuanced view now and recognizes that the vast majority of bacteria are either beneficial to us or we can coexist with them perfectly well with no problem. And in fact, they are what protect us from the relatively limited range of bacteria that have the potential to uh, to make us sick. But let, let me just make one point about hygiene, because you, you brought the word hygiene into it. And I mean, I think that hygiene is important. You know, I think that the, the, the 19th century lesson that it's important in surgery to wash the instruments very well and wash the hands of the people who are going to have their hands inside of an open human body is really, really important. I think that, you know, the lesson that it's much more difficult to spread disease if people wash their hands with soap and water after they go to the toilet is perfectly good. I mean, I don't I don't think that there's anything excessive with the idea of, you know, expecting people to wash their hands after they go to the toilet, but really soap and water are adequate. I mean, basically, chemical corporations sort of latched themselves on to this idea of personal hygiene and started selling people all of these unnecessary and potentially dangerous products. I mean, washing your hands with soap and water is perfectly adequate. You don't need to add chemicals to the soap 
that kill bacteria. And in fact, when chemicals that kill bacteria are added to the soap, what it does is it exacerbates this problem that we would call bacteria evolving resistance to some of the chemicals that we have that destroy them. And this really gets into you know, the, this incredible resilience and adaptability that bacteria have because they're not genetically fixed. Bacteria have you know, incredible means by which they can incorporate new genetic material, release unnecessary genetic material, exchange genetic material. And so they have just this incredible adaptability. And when we add these unnecessary chemicals, it, it really just enables bacteria to adapt. And so what we're finding is is that the antibacterial chemicals that are added to soaps are leading to the rapid evolution of resistant strains of bacteria so that you know these chemicals are no longer effective in the places where they are perhaps warranted let's use an example again like the operating room because of the fact that they're used in virtually every um, you know institutional bathroom in the country so I think that, you know, hygiene is important, but, but adding chemicals to the soap is not only not helpful, it's counterproductive. Yeah, I switched to bar soap a couple years ago. I haven't looked back. Glad I did. And, you know, there's also some evidence, too, around this topic that people who are, you know, I guess what you would call maybe protected, especially kids who are protected in some way from bacteria, actually have higher rates of things like asthma and allergies. If you're being shielded from this stuff with all this antibacterial, you know, nonsense, I guess, you're actually weakening your immune system on some level. And uh, Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the immune system learns by experience. It, it, it develops through experience exposure. So, um, you know, if let's say if we're just protecting kids and not letting them play in the soil and play with animals, you know, they're just getting a lot less bacterial exposure. And, and exactly what you said, like the dramatic rise in, you know, allergies and asthma in young people is attributable to this lack of, of bacterial exposure. So, so their immune systems can't fully develop. And what these autoimmune diseases are about is the immune system basically attacking the body. And, and so one of the factors definitely seems to be, you know, lack of diverse exposure to bacteria. Yeah. And along with this, for the past few years, there's been this amplification of the discussion around gut health. Uh, you alluded to this in one of your answers earlier, and this connection between the gut and the brain. You know, I'm of the impression, Sander, that the gut is the brain on some level. And maybe we've been thinking about this all wrong this whole time. And maybe we can talk about that too. But that general discussion is is not just relegated to, you know, dark little corners of the internet. It's gone mainstream on some level. And I'm curious what you make of that, because you've been talking about this for a long, long time. I mean, I mean certainly it's very exciting that there's, you know, this, this recognition that, that the gut bacteria are significant in all kinds of different ways. You know, I, I think, I mean, one of the reasons reasons why we are sort of seeing so much new information and so much new discussion of this is that pretty much until the time of the new millennium, the major tool that microbiology had for studying bacteria was basically cultivating individual bacteria and then studying them, which is really a human contrivance. I mean, in the natural world, bacteria and fungi are everywhere, but we never find them singular. Like you never find just one kind of bacteria. In the natural world, bacteria exist in these elaborate, elaborate communities. Lots of different kinds of organisms living together in any kind of different environment um, on planet Earth. You know, on, on a plum, on some wheat, on the skin or in the intestines of a pig. Every ecological niche, there are these elaborate communities of microorganisms and it's really, you know, only since, you know, genetic methods that have been developed in the new millennium that biologists have been able to begin to study these communities of organisms. But, this, but, but the study is really just beginning. And, um, you know, the places with the most complex communities of organisms, like, for instance, the soil, like we still know very little about the diversity and the dynamics among the different kinds of organisms 
bacteria, it turns out, have, have systems for communications. And we're just beginning to understand that and begin to um, investigate the, the complexity and dynamics of these microbial communities that exist everywhere. But I think that's why we're sort of suddenly reading so much more about it, because you know, it's, it's evident that these complex bacterial communities are not just vectors of disease. You know, they provide all sorts of essential, you know, metabolic and regulating services on behalf of plants in the soil, animals in the soil, and us huge bacterial superstructures containing trillions of bacterial cells. I mean, just mind boggling numbers. You know, each of us is, is like its own kind of universe full of bacteria. And we're just beginning to be able to study those. But I mean, it's, it's quite evident that, you know, they're not just freeloaders or parasites that they, you know, they give us a lot of our functionality and they're, they're a huge part of protecting us from the relatively small range of bacteria that have the potential to make us sick. Yeah, I read a book uh, probably four years ago now called The Mind-Gut Connection that that's really what changed my life, man. That's where I learned that you know serotonin and other mood-altering or mood-regulating chemicals are actually regulated by gut bacteria. And you made a point too in one of your books that the intestinal bacteria are actually able to modulate expression of some of our genes, which I thought was pretty interesting. I, I know that that's a thing. I, I just haven't really dug into that. Is there anything that we could say about that? Well, I mean... There is this sort of developing field in biology that's called epigenetics that looks at, you know, how different environmental factors impact upon the expression of genes. So, you know, each of us is born with a set of genes and, you know, we don't have the kind of flexibility that bacteria have. So for better, or for worse, those are the genes that we have for the duration of our life. But a lot of factors, it turns out, can influence the expression of genes. So, you know, not every gene will be expressed in the same way. And so, you know, different kinds of environmental factors, including the presence of microorganisms or different communities of microorganisms can influence the expression of genes. So, you know, I, it is a very new field of study, but it's clear that, you know, bacterial communities are among the kinds of environmental factors that can have great implications for you know, how our genes express themselves in terms of, you know, sort of specific chemical or, um, you know, physiological effects. And I should say, like, we, you know, it's not like we know enough to say doing this will help in that way, but just that it has been observed that different environmental factors, including microorganisms, you know, can affect how our genes are expressed. There was a good macro-micro analogy in what you said a few minutes ago about bacteria being found in groups, you know, which I think is a great way to look at how humans should be found as well. So just want to throw that out there for people. And also, let's go back to more strictly fermentation talk here. I want to read something. You said that uh, for you, fermentation is part health regimen, part gourmet art, part practical food preservation, part multicultural adventure, part activism, and even part spiritual path as it affirms, again, the underlying interconnectedness of all. And I'd like to talk about some of these practical benefits you then laid out in the art of fermentation, preservation, health, energy, efficiency, and flavor, too. But I also want to touch on the spiritual part of this as well. But you know, let's start with preservation. What are the preservation benefits of fermentation? Well, basically, various fermentation byproducts of fermentation. So fermentation is a metabolic process. The bacteria and or fungi are consuming nutrients and then breaking them down into different kinds of nutrients. So, for instance, let's say the lactose in milk turns into lactic acid. The proteins in soybeans you know, break down into amino acids. So there's, you know, different kinds of fermentation byproducts, but the acids, lactic acid, acetic acid, as well as alcohol are preservatives and they can effectively preserve food. So milk, I mean, how do you have milk without a refrigerator? How long is your milk going to stay delicious to drink? Not that long at all. How long have refrigerators been in our lives? You know, barely 100 years. In, you know, in 2019, most households on planet Earth do not have a refrigerator. 
And yet we can't even really imagine, you know, what do you do with milk? What do you do with fish? What do you do with meat without a refrigerator? And, and, and basically, you know, fermentation is a big part of how prior to refrigeration, people were able to effectively preserve food. So, you know, any kind of a food with a carbohydrate content, you can ferment it so that it becomes more acidic and it preserves. So when you ferment your milk into yogurt and it becomes acidic as a result of the lactic acid bacteria that develops during the fermentation, it becomes much more stable. Whereas the milk will only stay fresh outside of refrigeration for a day or two, uh, the yogurt you can enjoy for years. And then if you ferment it even further and make cheese where you lower the water content, then you have something that could be stable for years and years. Sauerkraut is another example of this. I mean, cabbage is not the most perishable of vegetables, but it's hard to keep a cabbage for, for months. But if you shred the cabbage and salt it and get it all juicy, that'll initiate a fermentation dominated by lactic bacteria. And as the acids accumulate, the, the cabbage gets very, very stable. So like right now, when we're um, in the middle of March, I'm eating a sauerkraut that's in my cellar that I made in November. So it's four months old already, and I'll be eating it for several more months. So, so the, the acids generated by fermentation are what enable the food to be effectively and safely preserved. And I mean, for people in 2019 who've grown up with refrigeration, I mean, it's really, really, you know, hard to appreciate how important this has been. But, you know, if we take away refrigeration and, and the other modern methods of food preservation, chemical preservatives and canning, which is sterilizing food in a, in a jar or a can, which is a 200-year-old technology, if you take those away, there's only a few methods that people have to preserve food. You can dry food, remove so much water that the microorganisms present in the food can't function. This is one way of preserving food. You can heavily salt food, add lots and lots of salt. And if you add enough salt, no, no organisms are going to be able to grow. But of course, the food is not going to be palatable. So then you have to soak it in water to make it palatable to remove salt. But other than drying and salting, the other way that people have had to preserve food historically is fermentation. And, you know, from olives to salamis to cheese, uh, you know, fermentation has just been an essential part of how people have taken their perishable foods. I should say people in temperate regions of the world have taken their perishable foods and made them more stable for preservation. Really important. Absolutely. Yeah. And you touched on something there that I wanted to ask about in terms of, you know, how the fermentation acidifies the food. You know, most people think that they would probably rather have a more alkaline environment inside of their body, even though the gut itself is made up of acid, you know, it's an acidic environment just to break down that food. So is the pH balance of food like this important? Should we not eat too much of it? I don't think we want to overly acidify our environment inside of us, but what are the concerns with pH balance when eating a lot of fermented food? Well, so, okay, in this sort of acid alkaline analysis of, of, of human health, generally it's regarded that, you know, sort of on the standard modern American diet, like people have an overly acidic condition that can contribute to a lot of different disease processes. And so it would seem that eating acidic foods would only worsen that acidic condition. But because one of the, you know, kind of powers of fermentation nutritionally is making minerals in food more easily bioavailable, particularly coming out of seed foods, grains, beans, seeds. You know, seeds have a various uh, a chemical means by which they lock up nutrients and make them unavailable to us. And fermentation can break down some of those chemical bonds and really make the minerals much more bioavailable. So, and because minerals have an alkalinizing effect in the body, even though many fermented foods are acidic in and of themselves, the net effect that they have in our bodies when we eat them is an alkalinizing effect, primarily because of how much more available the minerals in the food become as a result of the fermentation. It's a little counterintuitive. Yeah, it does seem that way, but I'm glad that you broke that down for us. And what else... In terms of health benefits, can we find when we are eating fermented foods? 
Well, first of all, I mean, I just have to point out that fermented foods are incredibly varied. So like, you know, chocolate is fermented, coffee is fermented, salami is fermented, sauerkraut and kimchi are fermented, bread is fermented. And it's not as if all of these foods have identical nutritional qualities. Fermentation can transform the nutrients in food, I would say, in four broad ways. Number one, I would call pre-digestion. This is the simple idea that as the food is fermenting, nutrients are getting broken down into simpler forms, being pre-digested. So I think that the, the most vivid illustration of this might be soybeans. The reason why the vegetarian subcultures in the West adopted soybeans as an almost singular replacement for meat and milk is that soybeans are considered to be the most concentrated protein of any plant source food. The problem is our human digestive systems cannot access the protein in soybeans. And this is one of the reasons why you rarely hear of people soaking soybeans, cooking them until they're soft, and eating them for dinner the way you might with chickpeas or lentils or pinto beans or lots of other kinds of beans. If you try to prepare soybeans like that, you'll get indigestion, you'll get a lot of gas, and you won't get the proteins out of uh, soybeans because our human digestive systems are not capable of that. And the Asian cultures that pioneered soy agriculture recognized this thousands of years ago and developed all of these different ways of fermenting the soybeans. And, you know, there's soy sauce, there's miso, there's tempeh, there's natto, there's many other variations. If you're familiar with those four, they are different processes, different flavors, different textures, different lengths of time, different organisms. But what they all have in common is that the protein gets broken down into amino acids, the building blocks of protein. This is pre-digestion. Similarly, lactose, the milk sugar that so many people have a hard time digesting, gets broken down in fermentation. Gluten, the protein in wheat and some other grains that so many people have a hard time with, gets broken down not by yeast, but by bacteria. So if you're making like a quick bread in two or three hours using a packet of yeast, that's not going to break down the, the gluten. But if you do what's called sourdough using natural leavening by a community that will include yeast as well as lactic bacteria, the lactic bacteria in that community are going to break down some of the gluten. So there's much less gluten in a well-fermented sourdough loaf than there is in a you know pure yeast, conventional modern loaf of bread. So this is pre-digestion, the idea that nutrients get broken down often into simpler or more accessible forms. The other side of pre-digestion is what I would call detoxification. And this is instead of nutritious compounds getting broken down, it's potentially toxic compounds getting broken down. It's cyanide compounds that are found in cassava and certain other kinds of foods that break down under fermentation. It's um, oxalic acid that in certain plant foods can be very, very high and gets broken down under fermentation. So, so various kinds of toxic compounds can be broken down by fermentation. Then you can have nutrient enhancements. So, you know, almost every fermented food or beverage has elevated levels of B vitamins and K vitamins compared to the food you started with. And, you know, this basically has to do with an accumulation of living or dead microorganisms that enhance those nutrient values in the food. And then there are these kind of metabolic byproducts that, that are unique micronutrients that are just beginning to be investigated and, and studied. But so in fermented vegetables, there are these compounds called isothiocyanates that are regarded as anti-carcinogenic. In natto, this Japanese soybean ferment, there's a compound called natto kinase that's gotten a huge amount of attention. It's a blood thinner that can also break down what's called fibrin. Fibrin is fibers that can build up inside blood vessels as we age and constrict circulation. So, you know, for people with certain kinds of health problems, like that can be an extraordinary therapeutic benefit. But then finally, what I would consider to be the most profound benefit of fermentation would be the live bacteria themselves. And you know, not every fermented food has living bacteria. If you want to eat the sourdough dough raw, that's teeming with live bacteria. But once it bakes in a hot oven, they're destroyed by heat. And so, you know, I, I don't say that to say bread is bad, just to illustrate that certain foods lend themselves to this, you know, live culture consumption better than other foods. But like fermented vegetables sauerkraut, kimchi, pickles. If they're not cooked or heat processed, they've got amazing, uh, uh, rich communities of probiotic bacteria. Yogurt, kefir, 
other kinds of fermented milk products also, and lots of other kinds of fermented foods and beverages have these you know, living communities of organisms that can help to restore biodiversity in our gut. So, you know, as a result of diminished dietary diversity, as a result of widespread antibiotic use, as a result of chlorination of our municipal water systems, as a result of the widespread use of these antibacterial chemicals, you know, we basically all have diminished biodiversity as compared to, you know, people living in, you know, much less developed kinds of environments or as compared to our ancestors just a few generations ago. You know, really one of the great benefits of these foods, especially if we're eating raw versions of them or, or versions of them that have not been cooked or heat processed after their fermentation, is that they can help to, you know, rebuild and restore biodiversity in the gut, which can potentially improve digestion, improve overall immune function, maybe improve mental health, and certainly without any big problems. You know, we see at the we see the ends of you know all the pharmaceutical advertisements, these sort of like uh, fast listing of you know all the potential negative side effects. I mean, I mean, I can't make any promises on behalf of fermented foods because everybody's different. But you know, I can tell you that if you if you try eating them for their potential to improve digestion or improve overall immune function or even to improve mental health, you may or may not feel the benefits of them. You might or might not experience the benefits of them, but you're certainly not going to experience you know, anything dangerous. And so you might as well try them. And I hear from so many people who have you know, just suffered for long periods of time with different kinds of digestive problems you know, just, just how much better their digestion gets once they start incorporating these foods into their diets. So I think these foods have, have you know, really great power and great promise. On the other hand, I mean, I will um, acknowledge that, you know, all kinds of unsubstantiated claims have been made on behalf of different specific fermented foods. You know, one website I saw promised that if you drank kombucha every day, you're, it, would, it would reverse aging and prevent your hair from going gray. You know, I mean, my hair has gone gray. It's not that I drink kombucha every single day, but probably have drunk kombucha more days than not over the last 25 years. And my hair has somehow gone gray. So, you know, it doesn't (laughs) mean that, you know, fermented foods are going to reverse the aging process and solve every problem you've ever had, but they can be extremely powerful. And I have just heard so many amazing stories of ways in which they have helped people. Well, regardless of the gray hair, I'd rather drink kombucha than, uh, you know, a Diet Coke or something. So there is that. <laughs> but, uh, Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. So I think one of the things that a lot of people struggle with when they eat fermented foods, at least at first, like when they're introduced to them, is the flavor profile of them. Because it can be quite sour and it does uh, take your palate, especially if you're on that SAD diet, that standard American diet takes a little bit of a transition period to get used to that flavor profile. But what is it about the flavor that you like so much? Well, I mean, first of all, I should just say there is not one single flavor of fermentation. There are many, many flavors of fermentation. I mean, think of the flavor of, you know, a nice ripe brie cheese. That's one very specific kind of a flavor of fermentation. You know, think of the the rich flavor of a classic Northern European whole grain bread. Oh, I love that. But, you know, what, what I'll say about the flavors of fermentation is any fermented food, whether we're talking about the brie cheese, the bread, the kimchi, they all exist along a continuum. And the fermentation byproducts accumulate over time. And so they, they develop a stronger and stronger flavor as more time goes on. And so if you're someone like me who, you know, just like loves the flavor of these fermentation byproducts, you can ferment them for longer periods of time and they'll get, you know, they'll they'll develop really strong flavors. If on the other hand, you prefer milder flavors and, you know, you're put off by some of the stronger flavors, well, actually your life is easier because you don't have to wait as long. You can ferment things for a shorter period of time. So I just told you about my um, sauerkraut that I have going that's four months old. Well, guess what? You don't have to ferment it for four months. If you prefer a milder flavor, you could ferment it for three days. You could ferment it for a week. And then you could move it to the fermentation slowing device that you probably have in your kitchen, which is the refrigerator. 
and that won't stop fermentation, but it'll just slow it down to an imperceptible rate. And you can enjoy your, your fermented product with much less flavor. One of the beautiful things about making any of this stuff yourself is it gives you some control over the flavors. You know, you can, you can make it very salty if that's how you like it. You can make it barely salty at all if that's how you like it. You can use lots and lots of spices if you like it like that. You could make it not spicy at all or just a little bit spicy. And then in terms of the acidity, the sourness, if you ferment, if you like that, you can ferment it for months and it'll get really, really sour and you can enjoy that. But if you prefer a milder flavor, you could ferment it for three days, for a week and a half, and then move it to the refrigerator and enjoy a milder flavor. So, you know, one of the, one of the beautiful things about, about fermenting yourself is it puts you in the driver's seat and it gives you some control over this. And, you know, maybe you'll start out just enjoying the, the milder flavors. And then as you get more experience with them, you'll start wanting to taste the stronger flavors. I mean, that's not unusual for people to sort of get interested in the stronger flavors as they go. Is there any evidence of the uh, a variation in the nutritional profile, depending on how long you ferment the food? Well, I mean, certainly, certainly the, the microbial community evolves over the period of time. Like in, in a mature sauerkraut, and I can't say exactly how long that would take because it would depend very much on the temperature of the environment in a warmer environment, it would be faster. In a cooler environment, it would be slower. But a mature acidic sauerkraut is typically dominated by a strain of lactic acid bacteria called Lactobacillus plantarum. Sauerkraut is actually a successional process. So it's generally initiated by a lactic bacteria that is believed to be universally present on plants growing out of soil on planet Earth called Leuconostoc meserentoides. And as the environment acidifies, it sort of that drives changes in the composition of the microbial community. And you go through different waves of dominant bacteria, always lactic acid bacteria, but different strains of them. So, I mean, the community is always evolving and eating it at different stages of its development, I would say would be your best strategy for maximum probiotic benefit because probiotics is about biodiversity and by eating the kraut at different stages of development you're actually getting these different microbial communities on the other hand the best microbial community in the world is not helpful if you don't eat the food and so you know i would say the most important factor is making a product that you're going to enjoy eating and that you're going to eat regularly because that's what will get it into your body and and so, you know, I, I don't think there's any virtue in fermenting it for eight weeks if that's going to make the flavor too strong and make you just leave it in the refrigerator. So, I mean, rather than getting too caught up on, on the microbial community at the time, I would encourage people to just think about the flavors that they like. The other part of this answer is that we don't really know. Like, like, honestly, biologists are just, you know, beginning to study. There's a great study that a, biolog a, a microbiologist who I know who's based at Tufts University, his name is Benjamin Wolf, and he has a lab that's studying fermented foods. But a very interesting thing that they're doing right now is they have a bunch of different farms around southern New England, and they did soil testing. You know, then they're looking at young cabbage plants and testing the young plants. Then they're testing older plants. Then they're testing sauerkraut made from the mature cabbage and then testing it at different stages of its development. So, you know, they're trying to better understand the dynamics of fermentation and, you know, how it progresses and the relationship among all of these different kinds of organisms that are part of the picture. But, you know, it's really, it's, you know, less than two decades that science has had tools to begin to consider questions like this. And, you know, we don't have all the information. We are learning more and more. But I always like to bring it back and remind people that you don't need to know anything about microorganisms in order to effectively ferment. None of the people fermenting anything in the first, you know, 10,000 years of, the, of these practices knew anything about about the microorganisms and you don't need to know about that you just have to you know because everything all, all the food we eat is populated by these elaborate communities of organisms the question is always which ones are going to develop and really the practice of fermentation is a practice of 
manipulating environments so as to encourage the growth of certain organisms and simultaneously discourage the growth of others. And that's all you have to understand. And if we have a couple of minutes, I'd love to just tell people how easy it is to ferment vegetables. Please do. Go ahead. Okay, great. So, I mean, fermenting vegetables is like one of the easiest things ever. You need to chop, grate, shred the vegetables to create some surface area. This is not the only way to do it. This is the easiest way to do it. So chop up the vegetables to create surface area. That could be very finely. It could be coarse, whatever you like. Then salt, lightly salt, salt to taste. Like don't, don't overthink it. There's no magic number of salt it has to be. Some of the literature will say something like 2% salt by weight, but you honestly don't have to like weigh everything and weigh the salt. You know, just lightly salt it, mix it up, taste it. It's always easier to add salt than it is to take salt away. So you chop the vegetables, you lightly salt them. Then what I like to do is get in there with my hands and squeeze them a little, massage them a little. On a larger scale, I've seen people, you know, take some big blunt instrument and smash down on them or tamp them. What you're doing in other cases is the same. You're basically breaking down cell walls and helping the cells to release water. Our environmental uh, imperative here is to get the vegetables submerged under their own juices. So you got to get them juicy. Once the vegetables are looking and feeling nice and juicy, taste it, make sure there's enough salt, add whatever seasonings you might like to add to that. And then you want to pack them into a vessel so that the vegetables are submerged. The easiest vessel is a jar. Just like a quart size, relatively wide mouth jar is the perfect vessel. A quart jar will take approximately two pounds of vegetables to fill it up. So you just chop your vegetables, lightly salt them and season them, squeeze them till they're nice and juicy, make sure the the, the flavor balance is good, and then just stuff them into a jar and make sure they stay submerged. It's going to produce some carbon dioxide. So if you seal the jar, you're going to want, you want to leave it in a place that's visible. So you'll remember to off gas it every day, especially the first few days. It produces a lot of carbon dioxide. And then after a few days, just tasting it, taste it and remember that the acids accumulate over time. And at whatever point you, you think it's getting strong enough, you can move it into your fermentation slowing device of the kitchen. But fermenting vegetables is that easy. Man, yeah, thanks for taking us through that. So I have a ton more questions for you, but we're out of time here. So please do tell the people where they can find your work if they're interested in keeping up with you. Great. I have a couple of books, uh, Wild Fermentation and The Art of Fermentation. And I have a website, which is called wildfermentation.com. And um, there's links to all kinds of interesting fermentation-related resources out there on the World Wide Web uh, that you can access through my website. And also, I teach a lot. I teach four or five-day residency programs uh, occasionally here where I live in Tennessee. And uh, you know, I travel all around North America and, and beyond teaching fermentation workshops. So you can find out about my workshops on my website. You can find about, out about my books on my website or buy them wherever you're wherever you might buy books. But definitely, um, you know, check out wildfermentation.com. Check out The Art of Fermentation, Wild Fermentation. And don't wait for any of those things. Just, you know, go get some vegetables, chopper, chopper, shred them, lightly salt them, squeeze them, get them juicy, stuff them in a jar and start fermenting today. There you go, man. Pretty simple for sure. So Sandor Katz, hey, thank you so much for the time. Really appreciate it. Best of luck to you as you keep venturing down the fermented path here. Okay, thank you so much, Ryan. Have a good day. And there you have it. My thanks again to Sandor Katz. His books are invaluable resources on the subject of fermentation. They're bestsellers for a reason. Part history, part science, part personal anecdotes, and part practical advice on how to get started with fermentation and fermented foods. Anyways, in the Patreon extension, we talked about the potential energy efficiency benefits of fermentation, the spiritual aspect of it, the alchemy of it, and what we can learn about ourselves from observing the process, the effect of globalization on fermentation practices and fermented foods, and what you need to get started fermenting. Hint, it's not much. 
You know, I mentioned up front that the Patreon audio is automatically included in the Patreon version, and I wanted to reiterate that because some folks have stopped supporting because they're looking for extra recordings they can't find. So I'm sorry for not explaining that better, but those extensions I talk about, they're already part of the Patreon audio if you're listening through the Patreon RSS feed or the website. There's nothing additional posted. I just edit out the extension for the versions that go on iTunes, Spotify, wherever else. So hopefully that clears that up. Uh, And some shout-outs to new patrons. John, Federico, Trisha, David, and Alex to returning patron Kale and to new executive producer Megan. Thanks so much for hopping on board to support the show here. Much appreciated. And if you want to help me out and keep this thing on the air, patreon.com slash oldculture is the place to do such a thing. Just posted a recording to Patreon of our latest book club discussion where we talked about Mark Z. Danielewski's House of Leaves. Maybe my favorite novel. Actually, it is. Who am I kidding? And an interesting and a rather appropriate discussion we had about that text. Also have another possible Raw episode coming for $5 plus patrons. I'm actually not sure if I want to keep it Raw or edit it for wide release, so we'll see what happens uh, with that. Anyway, I have a jar of kimchi that's calling my name, so I gotta get it before I get got. Until next time, you've just been initiated into a culture. I am Ryan Peverly reminding you to love yourself, think for yourself, and question authority. Please rewind this cassette.